Welcome back to In Other Waters. We just found the East Reef Way Station and what was left of Manet's diving suit, which had a propulsion system in it that works but needs fuel, and we can get that fuel over at the West Reef here. So I'm going to go to the Central Reef Station, make our way over there. But first, we have some samples that we haven't examined. Uh, not that. Uh, lab. I'm probably going to mess up the controls a lot because I'm playing on a Xbox controller and I've also been playing on a Switch a lot and the A and B or the do thing or go back buttons are reversed on the Switch compared to this controller so <laughs> that's going to be fun. It's Table stock. Bright pollen. Shimmer blooms. Stock root. Reef stock. Okay, that's all of them? Yeah. Yeah, we've got a lot of updates here. So, reef stock. Um, oh, we've got the sketch now. Nice. Theories haven't updated. Close analysis of stock root networks reveals something surprising. The root networks are in fact part of a symbiote, a different fungal species entirely which exists within the stock's bodies. This fungal symbiote provides a carbon exchange network which runs throughout the bedrock of the reef, connecting all colonies in a single web. This symbiote also produces the spores which the stalks use to communicate, but these spores are edited by the stalks themselves to act as reproductive agents, information carriers, and chemical delivery systems. If the stalks are able to edit the genetic signatures of these spores and their parent species, their intelligence and complexity must be way beyond what I previously theorized. Close analysis of Stockspore language could reveal an entire corpus of communication. Are there stock jokes, stock histories, or even stock literatures? Table stock. Is this entirely new? I think this. I don't remember if we read the observations on this. I don't think we did. Pale yellow canopies formed from many stalks entwined together, which reach impressive heights. Table stalks are part of the reef's many interlocking species of stalks, though these individuals can only be found in the eastern reef. There, they tower over the other creatures, providing dappled shade for the life that grows around them. One of the notable features of table stalks is the rhythmic opening and closing of their pores which provides a steady flow of water beneath their canopies. This seems to be highly beneficial to the growth of other species, with most table stalks being surrounded by many types of stalks and other species entirely. Also notable are the ball-shaped growths of differing sizes which sit high in the table stalks canopies. Sampling these might help us understand the table stalks better. Behavior. Analysis of a table stalk root shows a number of minerals not associated with stalk growth being extracted from the bedrock. Do the table stalks need these minerals to survive or are they using them for some other purpose? A cross-section of the root shows a central chamber typical of the carbon transfer system seen in other stalks. But unlike those stalks, table stalks have many subsidiary chambers, like a bundle of wires, each carrying a particular cocktail of mineral compounds. These secondary roots are not drawing up large amounts of these materials, just traces. But why? Perhaps there's some connection to those growths in the upper canopies of the table stalks. They're well secured by the stock's tight binding, but perhaps we can find one that has been dislodged.
shimmer blooms. Shimmer blooms are single petaled plants found primarily in the sheltered waters of the East Reef. As they produce pollen, as well as photosynthesize, I have classified the visible portion of these plants as petals, though they could also be thought of as leaves, serving both functions simultaneously. Shimmer blooms can be green, like most terrestrial plants. However, they can also be found to be yellow, red, or purple in color. The image of a patch of blooms is a beautiful one, and as they shift in the soft currents, they often seem to shimmer. The lower part of their single petal features many small stamens, which produce a fluffy, clumped pollen. Analysis of this pollen may provide some insight into their life cycle. Behavior Laboratory analysis of shimmer bloom pollen reveals it to be a heavy, sticky substance atypical for waterborne, for waterborne distribution. Unlike on terrestrial plants like seagrass, whose pollen is distributed by water currents and is therefore long and light, Shimmer Bloom's spherical heavy pollen seems intended to re resist distribution by current, and must instead be distributed by creatures who visit the blooms. The reason for this may be the Shimmer Bloom's tendency to grow on exposed shelves or pillars, which would risk lightweight water-transported pollen being sucked into the deep ocean rather than being distributed to viable sites. By relying on creature transport, Bloom pollen has a better chance of reaching another sunlit shelf or pillar. Yeah, that's very clever. Okay, that's all for now. So, to the Central Reef, and then the Western Stock Forest for some fuel. I did it again, I pressed the back button accidentally. We've got one, but the stocks of microbes these stocks release are incredibly toxic. Wait, what are you talking about? The suit is having to flush its vents with oxygen to protect me. We lost a lot of reserve oxygen. We're going to need to be fast when sampling these bloats. Let's get another three colonies. But be careful. I don't want to run out of oxygen out here. Oh, so it's the things that suck oxygen. The things that burst when we release um, the screech things. Shrill sacks. Sorry, not screech things. Shrill sacks. Sorry, it's been a while since I've played. I'm super confused about how to actually play. There we go. So I don't think that place over at the Western Forest is like a single particular place we need to go. I think it's just I need to explore the Western Forest generally. Manet's map data mentions a micro which only occurs in this stock forest. If we can find four healthy colonies, it will make the ideal basis for the propulsion system's fuel cell. I think I need some more samples of... Shrill sacks. I don't know if these are shrill sacks, though. Yes, they are. Yeah, so these are the things I need, right? What are those strange inflated stalks? They look like the sporing growths we found in the eastern caves, but there's something wrong with them. We need to break them open somehow so we can sample the microbial colony inside. Let's see if they respond to the shrill sacks. Oh, they do. Yep. 
Yep, let's go. Uh, Alright, we're safe here. There's another one. Let's grab some more shrill sacks. I think, yeah, that's going to be our last one that we're going to use up there. Now we have plenty of these microbial colonies. But where did this infection come from? The stocks seem to be struggling to deal with it. Or is this just part of their expected life cycle? What do you think? Hmm. I don't think it's part of their expected life cycle. Also, our oxygen's going down, but it's fine. I agree, this feels like a rare event. An epidemic, perhaps. But what is the source? Either way, let's bring these back to the base as soon as we can. We can analyze these samples there. Call in the pickup. Hey, you ready to get back to work? Yeah. Great. Because I've had a very productive few hours. I've been working on the propulsion system. I've used those four microbial samples to grow a new colony in the lab. Then I transferred it to a secure containment capsule. Nice and snug. I followed what I could from Manet's notes on building a microbial fuel cell. It's all loaded into the suit. The MFC fed directly from our reserve oxygen supply. Now we just need to take the suit out for a dive to test it. It's going to take plenty of oxygen to fuel the colony, so bring any samples that'll help out. But make sure not to take any we haven't put through analysis on the lab level first. I don't want to burn through hours of research material just to get a power boost. This propulsion system will let us pass through strong currents and move more quickly. We should be able to cut across that rift, north of the way station, and see what the bloom finally is. Ready when you are. Yeah, do we have any new samples? Yes, these. What are these? I don't have soothe spores here. We've got those in that. And these, of course. Yeah, that's the only new thing. Um, I don't think I need all of these. Like, I might as well store them. I don't actually remember which ones restore oxygen is kind of the problem, so I don't know which ones to take with me. I don't think the shrill sacks do, but I should take a couple of those with me anyway. Yeah, I don't know. Spark colonies probably restore oxygen. I don't think a stock spore would. A soothe spore? Probably not. I'm not sure. Wait, what is this? Oh, this is an entirely n new thing. We can interact with a crew terminal now. We couldn't do that before. Well, lab first. Reef cap taxonomy entry updated. Behavior. Soothe spores, the name by which I've come to call the reef cap spores, don't seem to be spores at all. Unlike the modified spores of other stocks, these particles don't have any reproductive capacity. 
Instead, they resemble endospores, dormant bacteria reduced to dried husks which can survive for hundreds of years in toxic environments without nutrients. Endospores are incredibly tough and high in calcium, and when released by the reef caps, they dissolve and transfer this calcium to the surrounding environment where it's absorbed by the local stalks. This windfall of calcium granted by the cap's sooth spores seems to allow stalks to augment their internal signaling and toughen their membrane to protect from predators, allowing them to recover rapidly. But the question remains, how do the reef caps produce these endospores? So is this like a, yeah, personal log? Manet is gone, and she's left behind one hell of a mess. This base is falling apart, cannibalized to build way stations out in the ocean. The communications array sliced away, life support failing. Where did she even commandeer this research base from? There's no way by call would have supplied it willingly after what she did to them. What did she call me out here for? To witness her disappearance? Or did she simply want me to encounter, as she did, the impossible life of this ocean? How could it have gone ignored for hundreds of years of exploration and conquest? There are too many questions to even begin. All I can do is keep an account of what happens here, so that if I can't answer these questions, someone else might. It'll be weeks, maybe months, until the next ship passes close enough to pick up my shuttle transponder. Until then, I'm alone. This place is unbelievably important. Our first contact with life beyond Earth. But something else is happening here too, and I need to know what it is. Manet's suit, open to the ocean, empty. What has she done? I'm trying hard to reconcile the Manet I once knew with the evidence in front of me. When I met her on Kepler 62F, she was intense and quiet, but calculated, intelligent. She wasn't someone to take unnecessary risks, to leap into the unknown. At first, I found her impossibly intimidating. Her experience working as a biologist far outstripped my own. Baikal brought me to the site as a consultant to examine her discoveries, but I felt like the one under examination. The base was much like this one. A smaller, older model, sunk in a subglacial ocean. Someone might think a relationship was inevitable, given those intimate conditions. But it wasn't the base that brought me to her. It was that intensity. Over the few years since, I've tried not to dwell on what happened on Kepler's 62F. But being here, living where she has lived, following her scattered steps, it's impossible not to remember. And as they have freaking cool it is that I'm playing a woman biologist, xenobiologist on an alien planet, and we're looking around for our, I think, ex-girlfriend. This is a perfect mix of sci-fi and also that hashtag gay shit that I love. Hell yeah. Okay. I guess we're going to the bloom. I don't have to go to the bloom yet. But I probably should. Yeah. Also want to check and make sure that the stuff I have is going to be decent for giving me oxygen. I have no idea. Okay, so you'll find the controls and the utilities where sampling and everything else is. Once you found the propulsion system, let's try it out. But remember it uses oxygen. Be careful. And you've got the hang of it. Let's try to cross the northern rift. Yeah, there it is. Prime before activation. What is... What does that do? Oh, that's part of priming, isn't it? And then that dumped it? I'm not sure. Oh, it's starting to... 
go out on its own, so I have a limited amount of extra speed. That is faster, isn't it? It should run out pretty soon. We'll see if I can tell when it gets slower. Oh, almost run out. Yeah, that is way faster. Okay. So, is this stuff good for oxygen? Spark colonies are not good for oxygen, they're good for power. Shrill sacks, a little bit of oxygen. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna request, request retrieval. I need to change out the stuff that I have. I think I'm just gonna go with what I've got. I've been experimenting a bit. These provide a good amount of oxygen and power. And these I just added. Also oxygen and power. Uh, a lot more power than oxygen, so that's probably not a great one to use. But yeah, I think this is good enough. I don't think I need to min-max this too much. massive split in the ocean seems almost too violent to be natural. Both sides are almost impossible to see from this center point. Sheltering pillar. This pillar rising up from the ocean floor deep below provides shelter from the rift. There's something on the other side. A huge green cloud rising up from the shelf. That must be the bloom. Northern Shelf. Less dramatically shattered than the central reef, the northern shelf slopes down gently through layers of sediment. Bloom Edge. The green wall of a vast bloom of some kind rises up ahead, swirling and obscure. The bloom. What ecological crisis spawned this green mass? How is it connected to the reef? If the answers are anywhere, they're inside. Ooh. The water inside is totally anoxic. The suit's rebreather can't function. We'll have to run on reserve oxygen while we're inside this place. Uh-oh. Bulbous and shiny, these formations sit under a coating of green filaments and growths. I feel the need to read very fast, so we spend as little time here as possible. Filtering fan. The water here is both highly oxygenated and temporarily filtered of its toxic microbes by the fan. Oh, are we safe here then? Is this like a... Yeah, a shelter. There's life still hanging on inside this toxic bloom, creating safe zones in order to thrive. Perhaps these creatures can help us learn how to exist in these toxic conditions. Let's take some samples and see what effects they have on the bloom when we deploy them. Pale fan. These pale, delicate fans are almost bone white against the clouded green of the bloom. New species. Occasionally, this fan shivers, releasing a flurry of green growths that have gathered among its gossamer spines. This fan sits among shards of rock, trembling in cyclical currents of the bloom.
What did we just get? Fan dust. Bloom oxygenating dust harvested from a filtering fan. It created a safe zone, didn't it? Can we use it like on ourselves? I don't suppose it would give us oxygen? No. I'm going to need these to survive in here. Toxic waters. Away from the rock outcrops and fans, the visibility in the bloom falls to near zero. Silt drift. A rise of silver silt fills the depression created by the corroded rock shelf. The tip of a shell pokes above it. Is that an eye? Is it? Bivalve creature? There's some kind of shelled creature hiding in the silt over there. We need to figure out how to tempt it out of its burrow. Perhaps a sample from elsewhere in the bloom? Something that reacts with the microbial growth itself. This bronze shell sits half buried in the sand. What creature lives inside it and how can we tempt it out? go. We've already scanned it, so I don't know if there's anything to really do with it now. Rock sheets. Here the rocky shelf of the reef flakes away into large fragile sheets with razor sharp edges. So I think this, oops, I think this is a safe zone for now. We see it's like lighter around here. Yeah, I wonder how long that lasts. Hello, creature. Rock edge. The shattered rocks catch microbial strings drifting in the water, draping themselves in a shifting web of hair. I don't know what direction I should go. There's lots of ways to go. Let's go this way. Wait, did that just... Huh, it didn't... Last. Why... Why didn't it last? There's a fan over here. Go, go, go. The bloom is fast. What could cause and sustain these processes on such a scale? With the oxygen gone, the microbes here must be metabolizing some other substance in order to persist. These fans have to be filtering the water of the bloom to feed. Behind each one is a small area of clear, oxygenated water. Silt bank. Silt has gathered around the base of this wide outcrop, and the signatures of life forms buried within it can be detected. Another bivalve creature. These creatures bury themselves to hide from the bloom's toxicity, making them one of the few life forms that can survive the bloom. Rock outcrop. Eaten away by the bloom, this outcrop is marked with a patina of tiny holes. Green storm. To the north, the bloom whips around in cycles of heavy growth, like a thunderhead forming. Ooh. 
Ooh, that one didn't last either. Wait. Oh, now it's taking effect? Maybe it just takes a little while for it to take effect. Toxic waters. Among the green, uh, among the green, I see tiny blue flashes occasionally flickering. Yeah, let's give it a second. Yeah. Now that one definitely just didn't work. I want to see what I can get to from here. Nothing. Yeah, I don't know why some of them last and some don't. Yeah, this one's not lasting either. Oh, another fan. Sorry, not going to stop to read that. <laughs> so far, the only uh, deployed fan dust that has lasted are the ones that are deployed where the creatures are hiding. There must be a connection. There's a faint fizzing that emerges from these fans. It appears to be caused by the coating of their spines reacting with the bloom. The currents of the bloom grow stronger as I move away from the rocky outcrops of its southern side. I know it's probably not going to work. But let's keep trying this. Ah, oh, there's another one of those creatures. So, uh... It worked. It's wherever those creatures are. Fan-like fins which can fold down and a simple set of retractable eyes enable the creature to totally conceal itself within its shell. Toxic waters. Green clouds drift above a rock floor honeycombed with holes. Can't really stop to read that. Ooh, huge safe zone. Go, 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 go. Up ahead, a fizzing membrane of oxygenated water. Is this what allows the species here to survive this constant toxicity? <laughs> 